a wise man once said that, you know, the, the progress of human civilization, you know, throughout history, the progress of human civilization, um, there's been a lot of regress, but there has been key moments of progress. It's nothing more than a series of successful conversations. And whether this conversation is going to be successful or not, I don't know. But um, the success is completely dependent on the interiors of all of us. So wicked problems are defined um, as, uh, they're wicked problems because when you're embedded in the problem itself, it's a difficult time. Everybody has a, uh, the stakeholders have a difficult time getting a perspective on uh, on that uh, problem. And we could say that the Israel-Palestine conflict, the endless rounds of conflict is, is, is definitely a wicked problem. And um, due to recent events, which uh, I won't even bother recapping. Uh, I think the whole world is aware of it. Um, it's, it's, it's a wicked problem on steroids at this moment. And there's a big chance that it could spill into a, a global conflict. And what are we going to do in this, in this conversation? We're just going to practice on how to hold this, how to talk about it, how to have a conversation, how to advocate for all perspectives um, and take your perspective, but also be open to, to, um, other perspectives because wicked problems um need new approaches they need fresh ideas they need um they need like diana always says we need to create the ability to hold that incredibly uncomfortable tension uh for some some something to emerge from that and um i'm gonna what i'll do is i'll just quickly uh introduce uh our panel We'll, we'll dive into the panel discussion. So we'll start with Theo Horesh. Uh, Theo has written hundreds of popular books on global affairs. And he Articles. Has been... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite, a, quite a feat. <laughs> hundreds of popular articles on global affairs. And he's the author of the book, uh, The Holocaust We All Deny, Collective Trauma in the World Today. Uh, Vince Fakuri Horn is a Palestinian American. He's a Dharma teacher, co-founder, of Buddhist geeks and an integral technologist. Tomer um, uh, Dweck is, he grew up and lived in a settlement in the West Bank in Israel, uh, Palestine, until the age 21, served in the Israeli army during the first Intifada, that's the Palestinian uprising. And he's an artist, a Zen monk, living in the USA since 2003. And he's a student of Diane, uh, of Diane's. Uh, Diane Mushal Hamilton, she's a Zen Roshi, a professional mediator. Integral facilitator, author of Everything is Workable, a Zen Approach to Conflict Resolution, and co-author of the book, Compassionate Conversations, How to Speak and Listen from the Heart. My name is Miles Kessler. I'm an American uh, dual citizen in Israel. Uh, I'm a teacher of Aikido and meditation, and um, I'm the founder of Aikido Without Borders, which was an Aikido um, um, project that uh, I ran for eight years in the West Bank, supporting Palestinians in Aikido and conflict resolution, and occasionally bringing Israelis and Palestinians together in the practice of Aikido. I've been living here in Tel Aviv since 2006. So that's the panel. Diane, you want to you wanna give us some guidelines before we dive in? Yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone to the call as well. Thank you for joining, everyone. Um, before I do the ground rules, I'd, lo I'd love for you just to take a moment to feel and just notice what's happening in your body. It might be helpful. I don't know how you feel about it, but if, it, if it's helpful to sit upright, just in terms of being able to take in more of what's really present for you and letting these sensations have a place, whatever they happen to be, um, they're the, the excitement and the fear has a place here as well as our openness to learn and the hardest thing in doing conflict resolution work is to help people stay in present in the body it's the thing that we do least well of all things so i'm going to just make that invitation from the outset that your body is really really important so just some quick ground rules it's a privilege to be able to propose this first ground rule but I'm going to propose it because I feel like this group is capable of it. And that is that we're basically for each other. We're for the well-being of one another. And we're here to include as many of our perspectives as we can. We can decide how to privilege those perspectives, but everyone's perspective is welcome. Um, secondly, this is going to be an environment of support, but also of challenge. 
We know that we need support and to feel like we belong in order to relax enough to grow. But if we're not challenged in our perspectives, we don't grow. So just check your check and see if you're open to having your perspectives challenged at all. Uh, the next ground rule that I'd like to invite is that we that we talk really straightforwardly, body, speech, and mind, and that we also are willing to listen, maybe in a way bring even deeper listening than usual if you can, just because the anxiety, again, we, t we, t we tend to seek for solutions in the mind. And um, uh, the heart is much more capable of including multiple perspectives than the mind is. So just to keep that in mind. Um, so listening is a way to connect to the heart. Um, we'll keep our agreements, which means that I will, I'm, I'm going to just I have a very light role in this because this is a really sophisticated group of people that are, they don't need a lot of guidance from me. But if for whatever reason we get a level of anxiety that makes it hard for people to stay present, I'll help. And if we're getting sluggish and agreeing, maybe I'll challenge and bring a, a perspective or two. So I'll do some light facilitating on the call. It's also important that we create a space to feel because sometimes feeling is the only thing we can do together. And so we might just take a minute or two to feel and see how that brings us into some kind of coherence as a group. And I'm just curious if those ground rules are acceptable to you. And if they are, just raise your hands on the screen so I can see. And if you have anything that you want to amend, I'm open to that as well. Thank you. That, that, that's going to help us. Thank you so much. So I think Miles wants to begin by just letting everybody on the panel take a minute or two to say, who are you? How are you affected? What's happening for you? Dia, would you like to, to start? I didn't want to go first. Um, I am uh, incredibly raw in this moment um, as this hospital uh, that was just struck was at least 500 people dead um, in Gaza. Um, that's the New York Times number, and it's expected to go way up. Um, uh, I'm coming from a place of valuing all all lives equally. I've done a lot of advocacy on behalf of Palestinian rights since 2014. I have um, uh, half my family's Jewish. Well, at this stage, they had more kids, so far more of them are, but I grew up half Jewish and um, have family in Israel, a lot of connections, um, have friends in, in the West Bank. Um, and um, this has been extremely trying for me. Um, I think seeing, I also might need to share that I've been a strong supporter of the Alliance of Democracies around Ukraine. I'm a strong supporter of defending liberal democracy. Um, and um, particularly in order to have a more, uh, to have rule of law, um, respect for human rights. And it's been extremely difficult for me to watch so many leaders jump on board with a campaign of war crimes. Um, uh, obviously, I couldn't possibly begin to condone what Hamas did in Israel. Couldn't possibly begin to. Um, and uh, I see the Palestinian people as distinct from Hamas. And that should go without saying. Um, and I'm concerned for the lives of Israelis. And I'd like to see a, the result of all of this be a recognition of the violence that occupation has inflicted upon everybody, but particularly the Palestinians who've borne the brunt of it. Um, and it's been difficult for me watching that perspective pressed down, minimized, and not seeing so many lives, particularly the lives of children, um, not mattering nearly as much as Israeli lives. Um, that's been painful. And it makes me nervous being here because <laughs> I know that perspective is out there and it can be hard to speak to, um, speak for as best I can a position that's been minimized. I talk too long. I have a stopwatch on me. I apologize. Um, thank you, Roshi, for asking us to feel into our body. It really helped me center down because I, I did feel kind of anxious. And um, 
Uh, there's so many personal levels for me on this, you know, issue because I was a soldier and I saw how, from a first person perspective, how it does nothing. Like the whole idea of controlling through power just does not have any long-term um, positive solution. And it took me a while to get there, but throughout my whole service, the the evidence to it was just on a physical and emotional and a personal level just constantly would hit me so that at the end of my service, my political view and my life basically changed. Mm -hmm. um, because I was I was raised in a settlement believing that we are where we're supposed to be. And that is the land that was chosen, given for us. And so it took, it, it really morphed my point of view and it kept on growing from there, but it really changed. Um, when you just shared that when we were in the, before we started about the hospital, my reaction was it does not surprise me because it's been happening uh, for such a long time. And it happened also during 1982, 1984, when Israel was in Lebanon, you know, a lot of people like to, not like, sorry, forget to mention the destruction that's happened in Lebanon because of Israel. So there's, for me as an Israeli, it's really difficult to put, you know, close an eye to what Israel has done. And I feel right now that there is not enough talk about that. And Maybe it's not the time yet, maybe it will come later, but I don't think it's um, right to not have that in the conversation. Um, why is this a wicked conversation? Because um, there's so many different layers of the perspectives. It's not even just perspectives. It's every perspective is so complex. And then you know, it reaches like nearly every, it's like just watching like, for example, the news right now in the US, how it's kind of siding with Israel. And I had a friend ask me, why is this happening? Why is the American always choose the Israeli side? And it was difficult for me to answer. And it's interesting. So I'll just stop there. But for me on a personal level, I have family in Israel. I have friends that are going through and it's right now not allowed to, as an Israeli, to say something against Israel. So I am very careful. <laughs> I'll try to be careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, right now I'm feeling um, a lot of uh, anxiety and I'd say sadness bordering on despair. Um, and um, this is a wicked problem conversation for me because my um my family on my mother's side um and my grandfather in particular latif uh is from palestine he left in 1948 um as a 15 year old and his entire family uh were um driven from their lands and so then he came to America. And so part of the wickedness for me is like, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here because of an act of ethnic cleansing, but also I'm, 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 I moved to a land that's based on the same thing. And I've benefited from that uh, on the one hand. And so it's like, there's not a clear way in which I can see in myself that there's some oppressor and then there's some victim like i feel like i have both of these identities i also have a number of teachers who are jewish students as a meditation teacher students from israel uh and i value them tremendously at the same time i feel like uh the perspective of the palestinians as tomer mentioned is just simply not given real credit do credit here in america and there's this very strong anti-arab cultural uh sentiment um that i've seen play out since especially 9 11. and so um i i want i'm sort of this is wicked because i want to include all these different perspectives but i feel my personal perspective is very rooted in the, in the sort of concern and care for what's happening uh, with the palestinian people right now as so i have family in the west bank who i care deeply about.
Yeah, and I guess uh, the reason uh, this is for me such a wicked problem is that uh, I mean, well, first I just want to say how 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 tender this whole kind of circle right now. I, I can I can just feel it, and and um, it, it's hard in a way for me to to move into this without you know without just getting on the edge. Um, I've lived here for 16 years and I wasn't particularly Zionist or anything that reason for moving here, you know, Jewish on my father's side. Um, I like it here. Sometimes it's love hate, but I like it here. Um, but, but I can see, I can see, you know, what was the beauty of what's been, you know, created here by, you know, the Jewish, what is the, 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 the Zionist project, I should, I suppose. Um, it's amazing. It's a beautiful place. You know, Jews are pushy, Israelis are pushy and rude, whatever. But no, it's a beautiful place. And at the same time, I can see, I can see the cost that that's had, especially in the West Bank. Um, uh, you know, with the occupation and um, and you know, particularly the settlements. Um, <clears throat> and for me, I guess one of the reasons that this is a, a wicked, or a, a, there's a few things I guess I just point on briefly here that are wicked about this problem is uh one is um that um well hamas is just is is just a, a for me there's no ambiguity um there's no moral equivalency and and of course hearing this news now um i just heard it from theo i haven't had a chance to read about it yet but of this bombing at the hospital um it just that's you know i i didn't know i could break anymore but that just breaks me more and um and at the same time I, at the same time i'm still clear in my mind that even though that's horrific, as horrific as the attacks that happened on the seventh, um, I'm I'm not confused about. There's no moral equivalency there. That's that's my feeling. Um, and the other point that I think that's wicked about this, uh, that's that makes this a wicked problem, is that there's a developmental um, uh, a, a blindness of develop of vertical development for the integralist here you know that's, that's just how it is it, until you reach a certain stage of development you can't really look back and see and not to get too much out of my first person here but i but i but i see that all the time in fact one of the reasons i, I realized that i could actually live here is because I, I i i suddenly had the lens to see oh yeah no it, it all makes sense it all fits right into place and you know pathologies of one level um don't get solved until the next level of development and it doesn't matter if it's Jew or Muslim or Christian or Arab or Israeli or Palestinian. It doesn't matter. Problems at one level don't get solved until the next level of development. So for me, the the, the whole approach has to be developmental, and it's it, it's not. It's mostly not. And you know, Hamas, which just kind of went, you know, full on red in you know in spiral dynamics terms, um, shouldn't. I'm just they shouldn't be they shouldn't be allowed to hold power over anybody. So that's kind of where I'm at, and it's all raw. Okay. I think the only thing that i I would like to say is that uh, just that I just appreciate you being willing all to be on the call that my my own heart is broken, and I also see the overrepresentation of the Jewish perspective and the allegiance the u s has with Israel. and I, I also am, I just want to create a space where we can clarify what that perspective actually is sometime on the call. That would be one thing that I want to bring forward. And then the other for me is that I've just been kind of immersing myself in the comments of diplomats and peacekeepers involved in the negotiations for the last um, however many years. I mean, probably going back to 73 and what their views are about why it keeps failing. So that's interesting to me per se, you know, like, what, what do those people know about why this particular problem has been so difficult? And we know all the dimensions of the, of the uh, different peace accords and what's fallen apart and whatnot, but just to presence the peacekeepers that have been working on this, I guess, is what I'm doing. Yeah, so go ahead, Miles, I'm good. Well, I mean, where do we go from here? I mean, I, I, I suggest, I, I, we spoke yesterday, yeah, Theo, but we spoke yesterday, we were kind of worried we might circle around the wicked problem just because it's so uncomfortable. But if somebody wants to dive into it, um, feel free. Theo, did you want to say something? I want to drop my own bomb. 
here. And um, I'm going to actually say this is a genocidal campaign that's being waged right now. And if it's not genocidal, it's pretty damn close. And that changes the whole nature of the conversation. And I'm going to say it because of this. The person leading the campaign, the defense minister, he, he made a number of statements. He described Palestinians as human animals. And he said, where, where there is Gaza, it will be no more. He talked about raising it to the ground. Then as the campaign got underway, came a campaign of an endless stream of war crimes. I mentioned the number of 286, now 87 hospitals having been attacked in the West Bank as well and in Gaza. These are just constant. Ambulances are being struck. 10 reporters have been killed. Two from Reuters, the major service like the Associated Press, Reuters. 11 UN workers in 18 separate bombings. This was several days ago, so I have trouble keeping track. Already roughly 1,000 children, but there's so many trapped under rubble, that number is certainly higher. They keep very precise statistics in Gaza, so it's always a it's always a low that you're going to get um, because it will be the ones that have been confirmed dead. Um, we've had a marketplace killing 60 that was struck. People were told to go to the south in a convoy. Multiple different trucks were struck with 70 people being killed. Um, the water was shut off for eight days. They have no access to water. 90% of it's contaminated. Then Israel struck the, the sewage plants. So you had sewage in the streets, but there was no way to refine more water. Um, people are drinking seriously contaminated water. I've heard the water that you drink that's actually good in Gaza. I've, I've had a friend describe it as it's all brackish. Um, so it all tastes disgusting. That's the good water. Power has been shut off. So as these bombings are happening, people are in the dark and their buildings are bouncing up and down. And uh, I heard a little girl saying she didn't know if she was falling all the time when the bombs would strike. She didn't know if the bomb the so if this isn't a genocidal campaign, this has all the signs of genocide. And Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinian people. They were elected 16 years ago in opposition to an extremely corrupt party um, that was essentially working with Israel to maintain an occupation over Palestinians. And extremely corrupt party. You had a bunch of clerics. This is a more traditional society. When they saw clerics' names on the ballots, they thought, oh, it's a cleric. They didn't know. They've never participated in real elections. Um, and then both parties, one you got one party in West Bank, one in Gaza, and it's a city of children. About 50% are, are, are children living in Gaza. Slightly less, but roughly 50%. So Half the people weren't even around, a little less than half the people weren't even around when the election occurred. Hey, um, Theo, Hamas, can I, yeah. can I, I, I really, I mean, because you're, what you're saying, I- I, I, I understand, I I, I, I I go on for a long time, so I'll-, I'll, but see, I'll but the, the, the laundry, I mean, again, I, the, we could, we could, we could- Got it. <laughs> no, 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 it's cool, I respect uh, it. And, 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 I, and I kind of agree with you, but we could put a laundry list of, of you know, horrors on the other side as well. Especially we recently. I'm well, sorry, we can't. We just can't. We, we simply so, can't. We, okay, the, how so? The, this is the worst Hamas attack ever in Israel by a long shot, by multiple times over. But, well, only right? because, only yeah. because we have this beautiful Iron Dome, you know, American weapons, whatever you can say it. But my God, if we didn't have that, you, you don't know. They, they have no precision weapons and nobody likes Hamas. Like Hamas is. I, so, I, you know, I, I go to the roof sometimes when these things yeah, yeah. are fired. I don't go to the basement. I go to the roof yeah. and I got videos and, and you do know where they're going and they're kind of coming towards us. Yeah. And they're they coming towards us. It's, it's, and bad. by the way, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're more sophisticated now. And you know, you know how war is. People give the more you fight, the sharper your weapon. I'm, I'm sorry, 245 Palestinian civilians killed for every one Israeli civilian killed in 20. Fair enough. Fair, no, fair point. Unbelievable. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, fair this, point. That is beyond disproportionate. That is a level of slaughter of civilians that you don't see 
anywhere outside of genocidal regimes. I, I, where else does that exist? But do you think, so civil, I mean, time. sorry, we're, we're going to, I don't want to dominate yeah. this with, you know, Theo yeah. and I don't, just one question. Yeah, yeah. Though. Do you think that the, the military is intentionally targeting? Absolutely. You don't kill 11 UN workers unless you're deliberately targeting people. The only place I, I study this stuff. I'm I'm just about through with my PhD in uh, international studies. I've written. Well, wait. For, do you think they're targeting? You think they're targeting civilians? They're targeting, they're, I'm saying it's not even just targeting civilians. They're doing exactly what the Hutu did when they started the genocide in Rwanda. They tar They killed. They killed nine, ten people from the UN. That you kill reporters. You kill the UN people. All right, so let's get hospital. clear. Let's get clear what our motive yeah. for the conversation is, Theo. Right. right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, and it's strong and it's powerful, is the need for people to understand the motive of genocide on the part of Israel. At least, and is, target, yeah. And it and is that what you want people to go away with? Is that I, sense that that there that there is a heavy targeting of civilian populations? Um, civilian areas and the places where people are most vulnerable. We don't all have to agree that that's genocide, but it's something. But, close. but still, what you I think that that's I think what I'd like. Me, yes, I'd like that recognized. What's yeah. most vivid is that people understand this. Just the the ratio of deaths on the Palestinian side yes. compared to the Israelis, and so you can't create any kind of a sense that it's balanced or that there isn't an incredible one up one down in this. Thank so, you. Miles, I. I want to because I, I feel like your I feel like your power in this moment I want to really take in and I want to let myself be influenced by that perspective, Theo. Like I respect it and I respect your work. I would like to, if if Miles, if you're willing, give yourself permission to make that argument for the other side. Again, we don't. They don't have to. The, the math doesn't have to work. We all have a big problem. We don't know how to solve it. Nobody's been able to solve it. So I just want to create space for you to make that argument so we can hear what is in your heart and then we'll take it from there. I'm sure Vince and Tomer have things to say too. But the but the power, Theo, is communicated to me. Yeah, I mean, basically, Miles, I, don't, I, I don't really disagree with any of the facts that, that Theo lays out. I mean, it's kind of, it's it's public knowledge. Um, I wouldn't go look I I know Israel. Okay, right? let, let me let me let me yeah, provoke you then Miles. Yeah. So how do you respond to the critique that if if the Palestinians put down their weapons today there would be peace. If the Israelis put down their weapons today Israel will be destroyed. Um, is there is there any truth in that perspective? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I, 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 it's, 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 be, it's, it's been repeated so much. It's kind of a cliche, but yeah. there is a truth to it. There's for sure. Now, not what we shouldn't. I wouldn't even say the Palestinians because it's such a blanket statement. Even though that's yeah. the that's that's okay. The then truth. make make a distinction. Uh, if the radical Islamists um, that want the you know want the Jews out from the river to the sea, you know, free Palestine, um, get rid of the Jews. If that if 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 that's the the vo if that's the voice that if they're the ones that put down the weapons, I think that the chances for peace is moving in the right direction, but you know it's still very precarious. Right. I think you have to have both. I think you have to have both. It's not it it cannot be like if Hamas does that or if Israel. It has to happen simultaneously in well, order I to think, create trust. Well, and and again, I, forgive me. I think that Israel is closer to being able to do it simultaneously, even though there's all kinds of corrupt power dynamics happening here politically, for sure. I mean, I, the protests, you know, that we've been having for nine months, hundred thousand people in the square every Saturday night. It's it's like ten minutes away from here. There's a lot of shit in the government here right now. But basically, I think the 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 developmentally speaking, Israelis are closer to doing that than than certainly Hamas. Sorry, I, I, about and that. Fatah as well. I would say. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I, You've had a okay, let, Theo. Let's let Vince weigh in for Fair a sec enough. from the Palestinian perspective. Go ahead, Vince. Yeah, he's um, like, great, no pressure. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, part part of the reason I invited Theo here uh, to be part of this dialogue was because of his background yeah. uh in understanding the the third person history and the way he's advocated for palestinians yeah. i've personally 
found it very difficult to even learn the history because of the traumatic kind of ancestral trauma, you know, related to this. Like, it's like even to look at the history is difficult. And I wonder sometimes, you know, how true that is also for Israelis, you know, in their own history. Like, how difficult is it to like, look at your own, you know, to, to look at the objective record and to sort of acknowledge, oh yeah, like it is disproportionate. And there is this sort of um, this huge one up, one down uh, power dynamic um, of occupation. And like to even be able to look at that is difficult. Uh, it's difficult for me. Um, and so, yeah, that's just, I, I, again, because I don't, because I haven't been able to really study this stuff because of my own you know, emotional relationship to it. I, I do lean on other people uh, like Theo who have. Hmm. What I was trying to say, Miles, is that um, towards your idea of like, say, if the, if the Hamas, which I agree that they should not be in control. Hamas you know, Islamic if, Jihad, basically. Yeah, if that that stream of idea that, that you know, destroying Israel, if they put their guns down and they get out of the picture, Israel will make peace. I personally, as an Israeli, I'm sorry to say that, um, I think Israel has to show a little bit more evidence that it can do it. So I think there was there was a movement like that, but it was gone. Yeah, yeah. And and we've talked about it, you know, in the past 20 years, the narrative is gone. So even people that right now say themselves as liberal left-leaning Israelis, really, when you put them on a real map, they're actually center and maybe leaning right. And then every time that there is a kind of like, um, you know, war happening, they all jump to the right. So it's kind of like for the Palestinians to trust that Israelis would actually, you know, there was, they signed um, an agreement and sorry to say, Israelis kind of like backed out of it. So it's like, I feel that Which and agreement was that. I mean, Oslo, I, I don't doubt it, but I'm just uh, Oslo. The Oslo agreement was signed both by Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and I would say, from my perspective, Israel is the one that is still, dim, you know, going against it, and it basically never happened. You know, what I'd I mean? understand that it was a bridge too far for Arafat that he couldn't do it. He couldn't face his people. I, I. I remember that a little different because when I was living in Israel, it was right yeah. after Oslo. Well, was, I think also yes. the settlements, the settlements yeah. just continue to be a huge problem in terms of what you're saying, like how genuine is Israel? It was, yeah, yeah, it was never really kind of, a, and again, because, because you have the power dynamics and Israel is higher, whether it's development or just have more money, just have more capability. I've always felt it is up to us as Israelis to actually help more you know what i mean to show that we're willing you know what i mean i think the israelis are the ones that actually have to do a little bit maybe go the extra mile to build that trust that's how i, I agree see. with that i actually agree because of the because of because of for what reason i'm sorry i missed that because of the developmental all of it because israel has more money has more influence has more access to everything uh, palestinians have they are basically under control both the west bank and has and and in gaza you know, it's like whatever Israel still controls them, even though it's a little in the West Bank, maybe there's a little bit more freedom, but not really. So that's my issue. My, my kind of like the narrative when they say we're well, we are balanced now, it's not balanced and and kind of like. But I do think that there is a way to kind of like move forward with that, but I think it comes at a price to Israel a little bit more. Israel has to pay something, not not with lives, not with lives. And it can be done because it's been done before. Yeah, it can be done. So Theo, go ahead. I know that you've had your hand up and you've been yeah. saying. There's a, there's a few reasons we shouldn't um, believe this narrative that, um, that there's no way to make peace with the Palestinians, that, that they won't disarm. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a real simple That's a one. question I posed just a second ago. Yeah. yeah. Why, why hasn't why have, hasn't Israel given up the West Bank? It's simple. Why not remove the deep settlements? Why keep building them? And they continue to be built. And but wait a second. But, uh, sorry, sorry, Theo, just one. One. Yeah. It's it's yeah. a security buffer. I mean, if they if they give if they give 
I, I, no, I look, I agree with you. Okay, let's do this. Let's, do, let's do this, you guys. Let's I just focus in. I, I want I yeah. to see the two of you go back and forth on this in a way that okay. something new emerges. Otherwise, we're just all involved in the repetition compulsion. So, Bill, tell him what it is you want him to hear. Yeah, and yeah. then, Miles, I want you to respond. And let's see if okay. we can see something right. new. Security buffer on their land. Even according to the, the Sharon government, which was deeply conservative, um, the Talon the Talon report um, found that a third of the settlement land had been stolen from private Palestinian deed holders. Agreed. Uh, the abuses in the West Bank are, are extraordinary. Save the Children reports 500 to 700 children abducted um, in the night, um, arrested and tortured, often with sexual torture, um, every year. Um, this is normal, ongoing practice. I've traveled through the West Bank. I routinely found people who'd been shot. It was the most normal thing in the world, often by settlers. You essentially have settlers that are constantly antagonizing the population. But what you've had there is a completely compliant Fatah government that is not resisting violently, that's cooperatively working with Israel, um, for 30 years, not a good government. I think they're a terrible government. I think most Palestinians would agree that they're a terrible government, right. but they've been yeah. working with them. Now go to the West Bank in 2018. I imagine almost nobody's aware of this, um, aside from possibly Tomer, because I think you referenced it. In 2018, they took up nonviolent protest in Gaza and Hamas joined them. They weren't fully nonviolent, but they put down their guns and they put down their rocket launchers and about 10,000 people went to the fence every weekend and protested. And what happened? And there were stone throwers on the margins and there was some weird stuff around flying these like silly kites, burning kites that might catch a tree on fire in Israel proper after crossing the fence. But when all was said and done, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember, was it Doctors Without Borders figures? Um, uh, 8,000 Palestinians had been shot, usually in the knees or hips, with hollow tip bullets that kind of explode on impact. So they tear up the flesh and bone. Um, and how many Israelis, how many Israeli sharpshooters were injured? Three minor injuries, one death, year and a half of protesting. Hamas was in the protests. Hamas was ready to take up nonviolent protests. No reward. They got disabled. I don't know how many of them were Hamas. Um, but they did security to keep the protests nonviolent. Again, Hamas is a at best, they're on a they're on a amber traditional level. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm not I'm not expecting much from them. It was led by a very they were led by a very green Palestinian with a vision, um, Gazan with a vision for peace, a young man um, who's finally learned to speak English um, so that we can hear what he has to say. He's a beautiful Gandhian type young man without the full force of Gandhi. Um, but nothing. Hamas offered on multiple occasions for it to have peace talks based on the 1967 Green Line. Um, but Theo, let me ask a challenging question, if yeah. I may, because you're, you're, you're an excellent advocate. And I, uh, you know, I, I feel, again, that your perspective is incredibly legitimate. And what I, what I feel like I notice is, is that I'm going to leave the call in a, in a very dualistic state of mind in which my energy is going to go towards the Palestinian perspective. And I'm not, I don't know if that helps me, if that helps us. So from your perspective, is this perspective more important to explore or is there a perspective around how we can, as people who are more directly affected or less directly affected like me, how can I think about this in a way that some solution can come into my mind or some way of supporting it can come into my mind what do you think about that i'll give Just i'll give of... a i'll give a simple rendition that would make life vastly more beautiful for palestinians and israelis okay and it's just simply every other country in the world that's not a complete wreck um knows that you don't occupy another people's territory you don't colonize mm -hmm. the other people's territory of course russia is doing this right now china has done it in tibet Turkey has done it in northern Syria. 
It's but isn't there a, but isn't there a really long standing historical dispute about territory? I mean, when you're I mean, taking private deed holders land and land that's recognized by the whole world, including the biggest backer of the United States. Are you United talking States. about are you talking about the settlements or there are other areas that you're I'm talking, talking about, about the settlements, the settlements in the West Bank. In Gaza, okay. it's been 16 years of having uh, being controlled by air, land, and sea, which is actually an occupation um, yes. by yeah. international law. Um, yeah. So the, if you want to, if you want to teach, it, how do you how do you deal with Hamas in this in in the occupation in the West Bank um, on favorable settlements? Pay return, pay people for the land that was stolen from them. If any settlers need to remain. Um, there are binational solutions that can work where people can stay in there and be citizens of Israel, give them, give them back the land, and then say, look, Hamas, this is what happens. Are you ready? But here's a, I want one more, one more thing to say with this. Yeah, one more thing. And then I, I'd love to hear Tomer's response to this. Go ahead. There, one more thing. There, yeah. there is a Palestinian Nelson Mandela. He's widely recognized. His name is Marwan Barghouti. Barghouti, right, yeah. Yep. He's in prison. He's loved by Israeli negotiators. I first learned about him in a talk with Yossi Balin from the 90s and yeah. um, yeah. another friend who was involved in the negotiations. Um, he's often scored as the most popular politician among Palestinians. Hamas has repeatedly said they would find him to be an acceptable leader. He's a Fatah member. Mm -hmm. um, he's strongly, passionately an advocate of a two-state solution. The Israeli negotiators want him out of prison. He's being held under terrorism charges. He always advocated for violent resistance, but never against civilians. Um, the negotiators find that fine. A number of Shin Bet, uh, you could call it security services in Israel, a number of these people have come out and demanded that he be released. Why don't, why don't all these things happen? So many things, so many opportunities. So, Tom, so Tom do you want to respond to that? Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, um, I will try to do two things. I, first of all, I agree that the settlement should be like the the whole West Bank should be freed of um, free and and become Palestinian. But when I look at it realistically and seeing how much the um, Israelis has put it, what it would do in from my perspective, it's going to tear Israel apart. It's going to create, um, which, which I think that, with all the demonstrations that was happening, I was told. I told Miles yesterday. My perspective is that it's already started that kind of tear. Israelis start that by themselves. Are we going to be an occupying country, or we are going to eventually let go of the settlements? I want to believe that in Israel there's enough people that want to let go of the settlements coming from a set, living in a settlement and coming from a family that has, my brother still lives in a settlement. Um, and I see in the chat something that they're saying it's too small. I personally don't really buy that message. I think the Palestinians can have a space and the Israelis, but Israelis will have to move out of at least, I don't know, 50%, maybe even 70% of the settlements. There's some pockets that, you know, have been talked about in previous agreements and they agreed to stay or something like that. But the problem for Israel is that I don't think it, it's not something the Israelis can actually agree on, like separating from the settlements. And but it is the solution that really is the only solution that I see. So we're going to have to go into Q&A here soon. I just want to tell the audience, if anybody does have a question, raise your hand. And uh, and we'll bring you in there. And also, I want to give space to maybe for for Vince to have the last word. But I can I just say one quick thing before we do so because one of the things that I feel like that I'm just feeling now and listening to Theo and, and I pretty much agree with Theo. And, and again, in terms of the facts, but I feel I, that me, and this is maybe more of a general uh, observation as well. But me, I, I really make an effort to hold both. And then I often find that the when um, people are rightfully, you know, advocating for the 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 Palestinians Palestinian side and, and all its truth, goodness, and beauty, and and, and the way that's getting oppressed, um, that they're that it, that they're not advocating for the Israel side. They're, they don't not 
not that not the oppression, but they're not advocating for the truth, the goodness, and the beauty that also exists on that side. And that that's just something I'm feeling right now. I don't know. Vince, you want to have the last word before Q and A? Yeah, no, and Mark okay. Mark Farman has his Mark has his hand up. Mark, yeah. could I? I know I've talked. I know I've talked a lot, but I actually think I have some creative things that people might like who don't like well, what uh, I had to say. Theo, before. just just hang on, hang on, just a second, Theo, because we we're coming up on our time, and I want to give fair Vince enough. A fair word. enough. Don't worry about it. Don't but worry. I'll tell you what. We'll if you want to stick around after the hour because we, we can go over. I don't know about everybody yeah. else, but we can go over, and you can you can share then. But then let's yeah. give Vince, and then we'll go to Mark Foreman. Yeah, I'm, I'm passing on that. I don't have anything to say here. Okay, cool. All right, so Mark uh, or um. Virginia, can you open Mark's mic? Mark, I've asked you to unmute if you can unmute yourself. I see. Okay. So I want to say something that I want to preface as not uh, what I truly would like to say, however, it, it is a perspective that isn't being represented that I actually think is objectively truer. And uh, yeah, um, and, and so as a starting point, however sad a starting point, uh, it, it is. So it's, it's my opinion that what we have at this point uh, regardless of how it started, is a war of displacement, a land war, and that for all intents and purposes, Israel has won that war, and it's not recoverable at this stage. It might have been recoverable 25 years ago. This is partly due to Israel and her actions, and partly due to Hamas and its ilk. Uh, like China took over Tibet with no backtracking lightly, and America took the native lands, Israel has effectively won by superior force. And the only thing to do is accept that and somehow, this is the somehow, as peacefully as possible, and I really mean that, allow non-integrated Palestinians to move safely somewhere else. I realize that risks a huge humanitarian and refugee crisis, and it's not ultimately fair to the many Palestinians who are not supporting Hamas, but I still think this is how history works. And we, this very smart, uh, multiple perspective taking group of folks are, are complexifying something while we are watching history as it has operated uh, innumerable times, which is someone else takes land uh, we've all done it in, in the collective sense, and I think that's what's happening, and I think that's where Israel seems to be in terms of momentum. Um, hey Mark, and who, who, who would you like to respond to this um, on, from the panel? I would say I would expect anybody to respond who wants to. I would expect the responses to be a very vociferous. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, so I'm not expecting a kind uh landing but uh i hear everybody holding the the complexities of the two state solution in some form and i just feel like i'm watching a different reality and in that reality things just got much worse for an already difficult if not impossible move in other words Hamas's attack and now what's going to happen in response has has effectively killed the possibility uh, that was already on life support. So um, that's great, Mark. Yeah, let's uh, let's give uh, Theo. He's got his hand. Yeah, let's me, give Theo a chance to res yeah. respond, and then we'll then we'll go to Mulad after that. Mulad and I just want to be clear that everywhere else in the world, this is called ethnic cleansing, and ethnic cleansing usually gets labeled genocide. So when it happened with the Serbians in Bosnia and they were massacring people and committing massive war crimes, we called it the Bosnian genocide. When it happened with the Rohingya in Burma and they committed massive war crimes, pushing them out into Bangladesh, we called it genocide. The international community accepted that. What I find extraordinary with Israelis and many of their supporters 
is that they can so casually talk about ethnic cleansing as if it's the most normal thing in the world. No, it is not normal in the world. Now, it was normal in another century. It was normal up to the Second World War. After the Second World War, we began to find that unacceptable. And after decolonization in the 50s and the 60s, we found it even less acceptable. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we began to treat that as genocide, which we hadn't called it before, um, as something that's absolutely taboo, that, that you can't push, do forced displacements, but certainly not of a population of multiple millions of people. This is absolutely well, unacceptable. Listen, we have one more one more hand up. So let's take this question uh, from Murad and Nilu, probably Murad, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll see if we can wrap this up. Murad, can you keep it um, short to short and to the point? I, I will try to be as brief as I possibly can be. Um, thank you for this uh, session. It's been very productive. One thing I want to throw into the mix too is that if if I remember my history correctly, there was a time when uh, Jerusalem was a shared um, territory. It was shared by the Grand Mufti, the Grand Rabbi, and the uh, Grand Patriarch. So there was a time when in fact all could live peacefully. Uh, part of the problem, point number two quickly, is that all of what is unfolding for me has its roots in the first crusade. And the first crusade came about because of an error of a benighted, uh, thick in the head Grand Mufti who set fire to the Christian quarter of Jerusalem. And word got back quickly to King Barbarossa of Germany that, hey, the, the, the Muslims are burning Christians. And, you know, he, he receives his king from the Vatican, his, his crown from the Vatican mobilizes, and that's how we get the first crusade. So on top of that trauma of a society hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, we now piled on the Balfour uh, Declaration, which in, intrudes the West into the Eastern space. And yeah, but, the but, 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 and sorry, Murad, if we cannot maybe recap recapitulate the whole history, can you can you maybe kind of get to your point, and then we can. We have just, we have an, we have ancient traumas playing yeah. themselves out in right. the present time, right. yeah. and we have to understand the roots of those traumas if we want to find any solution. It is not at all impossible for all to coexist friendly in a, in, a, in a peaceful society. It is quite possible. But if we can get back to that space, we might have a chance to understand the current problem because Israel is, is representative for the Arab population at large in the region as a presence of Western forces. It is not considered, even though their roots are indigenous, they're not being, understood as an indigenous force. They're being understood as a Western force, and that throws the entire conversation back to the First Crusade. And if Tomer wants to take it, or Vince, or you, Miles, or Theo, be my guest. And it's a very truncated thing. If anybody has any interest, you're welcome to contact me, email, and I'll be happy to continue the conversation. Well, look, the only thing I would, I would agree on is that it, when, when the dust settles, there's gonna have to be a lot of trauma work. Yeah. And every and for with everybody. <laughs> Not that I disagree with everything yeah. else you said, but I but I think that that's if that's the point. Yeah, I think we kind of all agree. And well, I would just add too that that's basically the same thing that negotiators say is when the dust settles, we'll be right back to where we were before. We'll be in right back to the same wicked where problem. where we we have to pick up with the peace process in some way. But Thanks. basically, Mark, what I heard you say is you you just put a completely different frame on. The whole thing and then theo i think you were saying but that isn't a frame that's acceptable in other parts of the world why is it acceptable here so back to you miles are there any more more questions or? well aftab wrote um uh, aftab if, uh, irfan hi aftab how are you doing he wrote um uh, about moral equivalence he said I'd, I'd like to understand what it means and i i guess basically what i mean is is um the idea that um when there's an occupation that the occupied have a human right to resist the occupation, which I agree with. I actually, I, I, you know, it's the history of whatever. It, that I, I agree with that. Um, violent resistance, it, it starts to get on the edge for me. Um, but I don't, I, 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 I've heard voices that are justifying what Hamas did, not on this panel. I don't know, but I haven't, you know, but I've heard those voices 
And um, and I just that's what I mean that there is no moral equivalence. Well, there, and there's no way to stay morally above the fray. So if what Renee is saying in the chat, it seems that the event at the hospital in Gaza City was the result of a misfired rocket launch by Hamas. Oh, no God, idea. No. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. we're, we're, sorry, yeah, we're not going to know for a while. It's going to be a while. Nonsense. before. This. Uh, just like, yeah. no, no way. Just... There's no, they've been targeting hospitals. Okay, talk to Renee. Talk to just, Renee. Yeah. yeah. I just no, it could be. It chat. could be. Oh, my God. Be so Come much, on. This is nonsense. Gonna, no, what, the rockets so do not fall. kill 500 people. They would have killed 500 Israelis with their rockets. So now they're killing their own people with five. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. It's more likely okay. that it was an Israeli yeah, yeah. rocket. I, 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 yeah. All right. There. If you want to, if you but, want to combine the two together, you can say that Israel hit a rocket that was going to be sent and it exploded. Oh, <laughs> that's that's how the as a soldier, that's how yeah. the soldiers explain it. So it's right. like I'm interesting. Yeah. Hey, Tomer, I'd like to to wrap this up. Would you please share your moment with the Palestinian? youth as a way for us to close this part out and then whoever wants to stay on can you talking about the story the yeah story that what, I've cha what, what changed you you got changed yeah. so um as i i served in the army as a soldier in the first intifada and most of our job was in the territories and in gaza strip basically keeping the order and um this was close to the end of my uh, service we were there was a lot of riots because um, Hamas just came online and they they kidnapped a soldier and they killed him like two days after and the body was not never found but so Israel goes inside and creates much more trouble and then we have to come in and settle down the Palestinians and quiet them down and we were driving and um, kind of like the end of um, a shift whatever you call it and um, as we were driving, we got hit by this massive rock and I was able to jump out of the car just before the the rock hit us. And I've never ran so fast in my life. And I was surely on anger and adrenaline. And um, I chased these three guys into a alley and it was very dangerous because I put myself in harm. But what happens is I chase them into an alley, two of them disappear and I'm I end up with one and I pull him down from where he's trying to climb on the wall. And when he goes down, he just turns at me and we are like face to face. And he just looks straight in my eyes and I froze. I didn't do anything. I, we were just like, it looked like an, it was such a long time, but it was actually a couple of seconds that this exchange of eye to eye contact and I didn't see a lot of anger. I didn't see a lot of hate. I just saw a person right in front of me looking straight in the eye and it stopped me. I, I couldn't do anything. I froze. I had a weapon. I could have shot him. I could have hit him. I could do whatever I want. Nobody would see it. But I, I, all I did is I covered his eyes because his stare looked wow. straight into me so strong that I, I just couldn't do anything. And so I just paused and I stopped. And then sadly for him, five minutes later, or it was a minute later, all the other soldiers came in. And as I was backing out, they beat the crap out of him. And I still feel, you know, sad that I didn't hold him and keep him from getting beat up because they beat him really bad. And that changed my life. And I was getting out of the the alley and I was just looking up and I saw all these houses and I could hear all the voices of the Palestinians saying Allah Akbar or whining or whatever, but I did not see one face. And this is like a whole neighborhood. They were all so scared that I don't know what I would do. And that really changed. It was really like maybe two months before I finished my service. And that was kind of like the, the end for me, like kind of how it's it's not it's not going to solve anything to just bring more weapons or more army or more power so for me that was my personal awakening moment of it's just not going to work that way so yeah what a powerful story and what a yeah. brilliant idea to end on it diane uh diane thank you for for keeping us on the rails
Theo, thank you very much. Tomer, Vince, thanks for kind of being my co-conspirator and pulling this thing together. Thank you all very much. <laughs>